Life is a journey and sometimes can be a lonely road. When first loved ones forsake you, all you got to do is to be bold. I knew it years ago that those who undermined me had their minds undermined, but I never mind. They should keep on undermining because I'm a real good. I must undergo mining. Talking of mining, it leads to discovery. We mine to discover. We learn to discover. We observe to discover. Friends can uncover you at the same time discover you. But I don't want to discover you. I would rather discover more. So I go on the internet and I listen to words of wisdom and intellect. Availability of information. Interviews of great men and women all over the diaspora and all the issues. Creativity at its best. Dexterity of research. No need to go through any formal education. I introduce you to the Discovery Show. Let your friends and your family know the struggles before the blow. Their highs and their lows. Pay attention to this show. It will make you feel at ease. The Discovery Show on YouTube got the steez. Now Perry, the presenter, please pose for the camera. I wanna hear you say cheese. We are airborne like a flu. I wanna hear you sneeze. It's true. The Discovery Show is live on air. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. See ya. TDS TV. Yearn to learn. Host. Perry Precious. Executive producer. James. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us here on the Discovery Show TDS TV on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. A show that basically seeks to interview professionals in the diaspora and beyond who are making significant impacts in their own area of as a profession. And this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are watching us from, we are coming your way with another one. Please leave your comments, send in your questions, and we'll definitely ask our guest. Some years ago, when I entered the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana, amongst the few people I was introduced to was one gentleman who later went on to hand over to me as the president of the Nursing and Midwifery Association, what we used to call KNU Western Nursing Student Association. He will become a brother later, a confidant, and so many others. I'm privileged to be joined today by Mr. David Ameyao. David Ameyao is actually the founder and the CEO of Holistic Nutrition, and he's also the country director for Syrian Research Institute. You are welcome to TDS Show, David. Thank you, Precious. <laughs> Thank you for the great oh, introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you after a very long while. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for agreeing to be here finally. Tell us a bit about yourself. Um, I mean, especially for those who are watching us. Who is Mr. David Amiel? <laughs> well, I think uh, nothing much from what you said. Actually, I'm a young man who has a strong passion for uh, impacting society regarding equity for children who are more or less disadvantaged or vulnerable. And this has driven me in the past five years into some of the adventures and sacrifices and as well as impacts that I've made in, the, in this past years with the support of a lot of people around the globe. And also professionally, I'm a nurse, I'm trained as a nurse, and also I'm a health economist. I'm a trained health economist and a health economic researcher. Brilliant and wonderful profile. So tell us, how how has the journey been for you? But even before that, let's start by asking, what was the build up to you deciding to go into BSc nursing? Um, what were the challenges and the deciding factors? Well, you know, our time, we all wanted to be doctors, you know. Uh, so I was one of the disappointed doctors. Not really, really disappointed, but um, those days I got I applied for medicine in Kenya University and also at uh, Legon. I got Legon. I got nursing for Kenya University. And, you know, Legon, they used to play this gala, right? You do the first year and they decide your faith. And That's there was this guy I knew who was very, very good. He was my senior. And I'd, I'd just, so my dad had given me money. I was going to pay my fees for Legon. And that afternoon, I meet a friend who tells me that this is our role model. 
that we were expecting to scale through had actually been failed. We had to do biological science for the rest of the four years. And uh, I didn't want to take the chances. So I said, Charlie, let me, let me just make my lesson. Let me go. So I just chose nursing straight away. I paid for care in USA and I came. And that was it. Interesting. So will you say at that point it was a matter of looking for security other than um, fighting for what you really wanted? Because like you said, you don't want to take chances. Well, um, in life, I think there are compromises. And I believe that whatever you want to get to in life, there are, there are many ways you can get there. Sometimes we aspire and we are encouraged to hold on and push for what we want. But um, sometimes it may not necessarily be that you have to use just one channel to get there. Hmm. I did nursing and where I am now, I think I'm, I'm better off, I'm okay. I, I, didn't, I needn't be a medical doctor to make the impact I'm making in life. The foundation in nursing, the exposure and the encounters have all added up to where I am today. And I think I'm grateful for that. From hindsight, will you say then that if you had an opportunity of choosing the nursing, you would choose that again? Or let me say, if you have the nursing and going into uh, medicine, will you still choose nursing? Or, of course, I'm sure I've put you on the spot, but what, um, what do you think? Sincerely, if I had the opportunity of going to medicine or nursing, I would still choose, uh, I, I, would, I would choose medicine simply for the fact that it gives you a very a higher platform to operate from. Now, I cannot tell you that if I had been in medicine, my life would have taken the course it has taken today. But I believe that, I mean, if you have option of nursing and medicine, then you probably want to step on medicine and advance easily from there than going to nursing. But I can tell you I've not regretted doing nursing because the seeming disadvantages okay. of being a nurse for all the means some passion and desire and i mean you know you are coming far behind okay so then you needed to put in much effort you needed to aspire more and i think it has all contributed to what we will talk about the passion what has I mean, what that led you into very briefly, but I mean, I very well know that after school, you went to teach in a nursing and military training college. And um, I just want to know, coming from a degree background, teaching in a nursing and military training college, which is basically diploma and certificate, what were your, what were your observations in terms of the quality of education we are giving to our people at both levels? Because um even here in the uk they recruit both diploma and degree do you think there's something we can do to improve our nursing education and midwifery education of course as well well uh first of all i must say that uh the two levels are basically very distinct very distinct in terms of content in terms of mentality and in terms of how you are actually trained to lead in in the in the bachelor's program or degree nursing, you, you are given a wider scope and the, the training trains you to be an independent decision maker. Whereas in the nursing training, uh, it's something like you are still in a college, even the way people are trained, the, the kind of disciplines they enforce, which to some of us, some of them are meaningless. Um, I mean, but well, that is a system that they came from from his Nightingale, and we have to do this and that. And I mean, most of which some of our colleagues, including myself and you, have challenged over the years, and we have seen the results over the time. Um, I can remember one day we had Kath, and one one uh, supervisor was saying that my beard was grown. And actually, I shared this. It was just my mustache, and it was, and I told him, sir what is it about my beard that will influence the care I'm giving to my patient? And we are here, we see many doctors come around, some in beard, different approaches, and they don't, they don't talk about it. And they, all, they even go deeper with the patient. So why is it that you suppress us so much to make us feel like, oh, it's a profession and all this, right? But most of these things have been changed over the time. And what I want to say is this, 
that the 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 diploma curriculum is is uh, is lower compared to to the degree curriculum. But I also believe that uh, essentially we probably wouldn't need to have a diploma curriculum per se. We should channel everything into the degree because, um, as you said, if you come to go abroad, it's not like diploma. It's principally the degree and other stuff, and it will it will quite advance. But it all depends on the resources that the government and the schools have to ensure that they meet the needed standards that a degree program should have. And finally, I think that um, if we want to improve nursing uh, training, um, the degree we quite see quite the, the process is competitive, especially for the public universities. But usually, one of the things I really hampering our nursing education is this issue of admission, where everybody has to pay a protocol to get admitted. And whoever gets admitted on protocol cannot be kicked out. And it means that when the person fails, fail, things have to be massaged by the top for the person to go to. It's shameful to talk about, but it's happening. And it's not only happening in nursing, it's happening in the military, it's happening in all these areas. And if you want to build a community in a country that can have standards and have sound foundations, then we have to do away with some of these things. We have to be pragmatic. We have to be principled that people get into the course and the program by merit and not by any other means which will hamper the conduct of academic matters. Thank you very much. Um, viewers, we are speaking to Mr. David Amiyao, who is the founder or CEO of Holistic Nutrition and also the country director in Ghana for Syrian Research Institute. Please drop in your comments, your questions, and we we'll definitely ask him. My name is Precious Adadi Diodu, ably produced by James Kovna Opong, and this is the Discovery Show TDS TV. So, David, what really motivated you to, I mean, focus on nutrition? We talk about holistic nutrition, but nutrition as a field, what was your interest? Why, why that well, interest? I mean. Well, I think that uh, why for one, I won't say that we had a very strong nutrition background. Okay, we were taught by Shaban and Co. We had all those things, but mine was not physically academic. It was quite pragmatic and an experience. Uh, here was I at Kofanochi trying to look for a case study patient. So I was trying to passing through the C3, C4, and I saw a man crying. This man was actually from a man in Kwame downstairs area. And I approached her, why are you crying? And she was like, my son. This boy started crawling and had started muttering words, but he has regressed. Now cannot crawl, cannot even mutter a word, it's simply because he was malnourished. So the light bulb clicked. So there is a condition that can cause a child to regress this much. Oh, really? And I was in a malnutrition world. Um, so it clicked. So I comforted her. I told her oh, she'll be fine. The child will come back. And I left. So going home, I read on it because it was a dominant talk. So finally, about two weeks later, here I am. I find myself with police at Ejusu Castle in the Ashanti region for my public health internship. And we're on school, um, public health school visit. And we see this boy who has crushed your call. And it clicked. This boy, this boy probably is going to suffer some of the things I read about malnutrition. Because simply, I came to understand that when a child is malnourished, it's not just being sick. When a child is malnourished, it means that their physical growth is retarded. He will be shorter and weaker than other kids. He has a chance of dying. I mean, malnutrition contributes to one in four deaths among children in five. So he's at risk of dying. And if he doesn't die, he would fall sick frequently. And beyond that, it's not only that the body, physical body is not growing, the brain is not developing well, it's optimum. And if the brain does not develop to its optimum, schooling will be difficult, academic achievement will be difficult, such an individual will end up also, um, such an individual will end up going into the, what do you call it? Not becoming 
dropping out of school by senior high school. And if somebody drops out of school by senior high school, then they may not be able to join the skilled labor force. They may probably be unskilled. And even in the skilled or unskilled labor force, their input will be small, so they are going to make an income earners. So they've been mega income earners. It means that such a child will probably be poor and mostly they will be poor. Now, the sad news is that if they are poor, their kids are also going to be poor. The intergenerational malnutrition cycle and poverty cycle will continue. And again, this child at this young age of being malnourished, that is whether having marasmus cause your poor protein energy malnutrition, will be predisposed for chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and others as an adult in the future. And they've been poor as an adult. They are going to lose out on the ability to assess care, and it will further push them below the poverty line. So to me, malnutrition is all about a child and his future and opportunity to grow and develop, and also about society developing. Now, so I knew that if we will be productive as a community, and if we will succeed as a people, as a people no child falls into malnutrition. So straight ahead, I organized myself with a colleague, Baba Alaji, who was my boss mate, and we mobilized home foods and others with consulting with the nurse at Confanochi. Unfortunately, this boy's father was crippled, and mother was deaf and dumb. So we had to basically supply a in and supply a few things. And we rehabilitated the boy, and the boy got well. That was my basic experience. We went there, we left, and I mean, we, I just forgotten about it. Until somewhere, that was 2013. Until somewhere 2014, when there was a challenge that I needed to look out for something to do. That I thought about something I wanted to do before. And I went to visit this boy and he was doing extremely well and he couldn't even recognize him quite tall and all that. And that was yeah. the, what set me on on the path for holistic nutrition. So that was my interest in nutrition. Interesting. I mean, that is that is very insightful. I mean, it's you've come a long way and I think holistic nutrition is now five years, isn't it? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Happy anniversary to you. But you took Thank a very you. daring decision, I must say. We were all teaching in nursing and midwifery training college. One day you wake up and say, I want to quit and I want to go into the focus on just delivering or being entrepreneurial, trying to help children who are malnourished. I mean, there are nurses who are watching us or people from other fields who may want to be entrepreneurial, who may want to venture into other things. What did you consider to take those boosters? Because, of course, at that point, there wasn't going to be any funding for you at that point. What do you have to share if someone wants to take a similar route? Well, uh, the decision I took, um, I still look at myself today and I wonder what actually came over me. Not necessarily because I don't know what came over me, but I believe that it was one of the greatest sacrifices of my life. Here was I, I've been trying to, to start this malnutrition thing. Around 2015, I started taking children from Mubasi Government Hospital as, as a service personnel, taking them to Kumasi for treatment, and myself and some colleagues, Mr. Mwako and Sarah, will pay for, for the treatment of these kids. But uh, somewhere 2016, I found a child that was malnourished, and I needed to treat them in the world. Mm. But now I got a job at Kwa Foundation Training, and I'm there teaching. And I realized that, okay, I will use my spare time to come and do this in Obuasi because I knew a lot of kids were there. Now, we have begun a semester fresh and we have shared the subjects. I've divided myself in the course with Aku and all that. And I was in service one Wednesday evening online. I attended Winnie Chapel. And uh, in the course of the service, I had written my examination letter that I'm coming back to Obuasi to start malnutrition treatment for kids. Now, the reason is that those days when I was a service person, one guy took the chart and, and I checked, I made a colleague called Christopher call the mothers whose kids have been referred to Confanochi to get treatment because they were malnourished. And for about 8% of the people he called, the child had died. 
and the remainder, the child was worse. So to me, essentially, if there was anything that could take the life of a child and could actually shatter his life for, 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 for a life course, then my life wasn't so important to, to lay down to help save these people. So I resigned on the 10th of March. No, I, I resigned on the 11th of March and 12th of March, 2017, I set off. And when I sat in a car and so I went to the school, they should give me the pickup because they came to pick my things from Obasi to Papua. And now they have to help me pick my things back to Obasi and they said there's no fuel in the car. <laughs> because now you're going, nobody cares about you. So I sat in a trot road, picked the things that I could pick. And as I descended, there was a hill you have to descend. I started, tears started coming from my eye because I had given everything away. And the background is this. I had worked in this nursing training, you know this, for one year, three months as a casual worker. I was receiving 400 cities. Now, that same week, I'd gone for my medicals and I and for an interview, and I met you, Precious. You were there too. And we were waiting for our appointment. And actually, the, when I left the school, I resigned. The next two days, my appointment was in. And I'll be mechanized and receiving over 2,500 cities. And they called me and I said, no, I've made a decision. I want to lay my, I want to do something for these kids. I don't want to see them dying. And that was the burden I took over myself. I became homeless. We, there were points where, I mean, we've gone through a lot in, in getting this done. I remember Precious, Victor, my colleague who's no more with us, but he was very instrumental. He, he made the sacrifice and he sacrifice and made him acknowledge him for that. And yeah. that was why I took that step. And today, yeah, right. today I look back and say that it's been worth it. We have treated over, I mean, not impact, but children. Yeah, so, I mean, just because of time, Dave, so take us, yeah. explain to us what holistic nutrition is all about, what the impact has been over the time, what are some of the key things you've done, if you can take about five minutes to cover that for us, that would be great. Yeah, so um, holistic nutrition actually was to was set up. Our tagline is that sustainable nutrition equals productive life. So we think that if people are sustainably nourished, then their life will be productive and contribute to socioeconomic development in the country. But when we started, our main focus was malnutrition. And that is what we've done over the past five years. And we started with community outreaches, screening children for malnutrition, and providing free treatment for them. Now the treatment lasts over three to four months. And essentially we are going to spend like um, roughly, um, I'm trying to do the conversion because the CDS rate is passing quickly. But as of December, when this inflation had not set in, you need roughly, um, let's say, let me, I, I want to, Okay, so roughly about three, um, about two hundred to three hundred um, dollars, okay. to about three hundred dollars to rehabilitate a child. So okay. we started this, and thanks to the support of PPB and other stakeholders in Mountainness, we have been able to provide treatment to over three hundred and thirty children okay. who we have treated. Three hundred and thirty children. And uh, more, I mean, our recovery rate is over 85 percent, far above the standard CMAM. Yeah, and actually, um, these kids, out of these 300 and something kids, there are about over 50 to 100 that we can pinpoint and say, but for our intervention, this case wouldn't have lived. Mm. And that is what makes me proud. Makes me proud of a team. Makes me proud of our donors and the people who support us. Apart from treatment for malnutrition, during the COVID season, so we have been doing malnutrition treatment. In so, Dave, let me let me mention to our viewers that whilst you're talking, I have a few of your pictures that I'm just going to scroll on the on the on the screen so that you can have a look. I mean, at what Dave and his team has been doing. Keep it going. Great, Dave. great. So th those are pictures of impact, the before and after of some of the kids. You can see them now. Apart from treating children for malnutrition. We realized along the line that uh, some of these kids actually, the problem is not just being malnourished, the problem is that they are food insecure. Some of them are orphans, some of them are living with their grandparents, some of them are living with single mothers and they, they actually do not have any source of income and others. So what we decided to do was that, okay, during the COVID, 
these kids were at risk of re re relapsing. And actually, this particular child on the screen, when we went back, he had relapsed. So we decided to provide food to the household. So we started with 10 kids. And we provided food relief boxes of about, let's say, um, let's say uh, $50 for a box. We gave rice and oil and all those things to the family. And we also went ahead and got Brunat, which is a nutrient supplement for the kids. And we provided to 1,500 children across Obuasi, across 42 communities, distributing Brunat to supplement their nutrition so that COVID will not let them fall into malnutrition. In terms mm -hmm. of the support of the peanut butter and our donors and our partners. Now, again... So, so Dave, let's put it in perspective. What you're saying is that I mean, it's not like you have some great amount of money sitting somewhere that you've been just dishing out to sponsor this. No, but no, you no. need a lot of support from people. And there Definitely. are people who voluntarily give money to support these people. And your team go ahead to actually implement these policies. Definitely. So in essence, you need more of that support, isn't it? Definitely, definitely, definitely. You see, through the contributions and giving of people, we have been able to impact over 11,000 children. Now we have wow. given, yeah, over 11,000 children. Yeah, over 11,000 children. Only 313 treated for man, uh, 330 treated for malnutrition. But we have given food relief buses to, uh, I mean, last year, with in conjunction with Project Peanut Butter, we denoted over 500 food relief boxes, $50 each to families and households. Just last week, we donated 20 boxes. In Christmas, we donated 50 food relief boxes. And as it stands now, what we are doing is that we are actually running a program. We are starting an active food bank. Okay. We are running an active food bank where we can uh, provide support for some of these vulnerable kids who need continuous support to thrive. Okay. So okay. in that vein, we are giving them food relief buses monthly, twice, every, uh, once every two months or three months, depending on their, so on their need. Because some of these kids, they actually need it. And that is why what we are doing now. Yeah, so mm -hmm. actually we run the malnutrition clinic every Tuesday. Every Tuesday we have over 10 to 15 kids coming to our clinic and we also give food relief buses. And by God's grace, through what we do, we have about 10 kids already in school. Two of them have been by one by Bartnoff schools, one by Winterfell school, and the others we support amongst ourselves, our volunteers and our donors support these kids in schools because without us, we would never be able to step in school. And that is what uh, it is. Deva, I think just just to help put things in perspective, I think what you what you are saying basically is that apart from providing food for these kids, you don't just leave them there. Those who need education, no. you make every effort to ensure that you put them in school. And yeah. basically, this is a sacrificial job because at first you sacrifice the job, which I'm I'm very much aware of, just to go into this and focus on that. And not because you had the money to do that, but it was no, an adventurous, I mean, task, a very huge one, of course, that you decided to venture into. And this is how far you've been able to come, making an impact in the lives of 11,000 children and, of course, yeah. their families as well. That yeah. that obviously is a very great one. Um, I mean, congrats to you and your oh, team. Thanks. Well done for the great, great impact. Thanks very much, David. So Thank for you, for for these kids, what really I'm sure anytime you see them, there are some sort of a, a segment that comes to you and all that. There are people who are watching us. I mean, because of time, that's why, but I'm sure you you touch on this at the end of it again. There are people mm -hmm. who are watching us who are nurses, doctors, who are whatever. They may want to go into entrepreneurship. What are some of the challenges that are associated with being an entrepreneur? Well, uh, one of the things, I mean, most people do not see us as an entrepreneur, but you know, entrepreneurship is not only for financial profit. What you're doing, we have the spiritual profit and we also have the social profit. Now, one of the things I can tell you is that you must be willing to die. Mm. Set a corner of wheat to the ground and it dies, it abides alone. Mm. And, but when it dies, it shall bring forth much fruit. 
There have been numerous challenges, lack and want, digestion by family and friends. There was a time where we were so broke, I needed to do yogurt and spring rolls to sell. And I will meet some of my former students. I was teaching in nursing trainers. Hey, say, and then they also go look and, and you hurt. Yeah, I mean, like, like seriously. <laughs> and to many people, it seems like you are visionless, you are lazy. And people even think that you are in it because NGO will make you rich. But wow. by God's grace, I can say that I have never taken from holistic. We continually give. Not less than 10% of my income every month goes back to holistic. Mm. Yeah. So it's, mm. it's all about the fact that you have to make up your mind that this is the impact you want to make. This is what you want to do. And you must be willing to sacrifice everything, absolutely everything to get into it. And if you keep focused and you are diligent with God on your side, the holistic is not where it used to be. By God's wow. grace, we have crossed, we have impacted, and we are getting known by God's grace. So you will definitely succeed if okay. you are willing to sacrifice. Wow. So it's it's a sacrifice. If you want it's to be sacrifice. entrepreneur, especially if you want to go into these NGOs to be philanthropic, it's it's sacrificial, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Great. It is. I mean, all these all these border on I mean hunger and all that. You want to take some time. I saw a post from you some time ago. I'm going to put that on the screen here about hunger in Africa. Do you want to generally, if there's someone watching us who want to have a fair idea, why really do you want to focus on malnutrition and all that? Do we have a problem of hunger in Africa? I'm sure anecdotally, all of us will think there's a lot of hunger in Africa, but I saw a post from you. That's why I pull up this. Do you want to take us through this and perhaps put the conversation in perspective? So that people know the needs we have in Ghana, in Africa, Nigeria, wherever people are watching us from. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this actually is a summary of the state of hunger or the cost of hunger in Africa. It was a report that was done specifically for Ghana. So it says that 10 things everyone should know about child nutrition in Ghana. And it tells us that, and that was this data was collected from 2012. Report was published in 2016. At that time, Ghana still had an active child malnutrition treatment program ongoing called CMAP. And as at then, it was saying that stunting was around 19%, and one out of three children who were suffering from what malnutrition or undernutrition received medical attention. That means that over 60% of children who were suffering malnutrition, then when Ghana had an active treatment program, usually in the northern region, we're not receiving treatment. Wow. And it tells us that about 24% of all childhood deaths in Ghana are as a result of childhood malnutrition. All 10.5% of all school repetitions are associated with childhood malnutrition. And actually, 37% of our adult workforce actually have suffered from stunting. And we have lost 7.3% of our productive workforce as a result of child malnutrition. And the, 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 the banga is that as of 2012 to 2016, as of 2012, Ghana lost 6.4% of its gross domestic product, GDP, which was 6.4 billion Ghana cities of uh, $2.6 billion as a result of childhood malnutrition in the country. So we are here looking for IMF and others, but I mean, the truth is this. No country ever develops when they don't deal with malnutrition. If you go mm. to the US, malnutrition rates are very low. That is why I mean, every country that is developed, you see malnutrition rates are very low. So if we want to develop, this is the task ahead of us. This report, unfortunately, has been shelved. Now, fast forward around 2016, 2017, development partners like UNICEF and, and all those guys who are supporting the active malnutrition treatment programs in Ghana pulled up support because we are transitioned from a lower income country to a lower middle income country. That means the basket of services and donor support we could receive were limited. So mm. till date, there is no, no, actually no CMAM program running. What is actually happening is the COVID relief, which included mm. the division of RUTF to some regions. And I'm proud that when we presented to the Scaling Up Nutrition Development Platform, we drew attention on Ashanti region. And this time, 
Ashanti Region has received, received RUTF through our advocacy interventions on that platform. Fantastic. That's great. I, I'm sure this is what you're talking about earlier, isn't it? Um, yes. Do you want to touch on this in about 30 seconds, if you don't mind? Yes. So what we are trying to say is that every child, regardless of socioeconomic background, who gave birth to them, whether their parents are careless, give birth to a lot of kids, whatever, forget about them. They deserve their own life, independent of their patient. Every child deserves a GDP. Mm. And to us, GDP means an equal opportunity to grow physically, mm. develop cognitively, and prosper economically. And that is our mandate. So our mission is to ensure that every child has equitable access to food, health, and nutrition care, which contributes to their optimal growth and development, optimal growth, development, and prosperity. That is a GDP. Thank you very much, Dave, um, for sharing that with us. Viewers, thanks very much for being here. Please drop your comments, your questions, and you ask David. Meet Mr. X, an unhappy businessman who has been waiting for days for his goods to be delivered. Unlike Mr. X, business is booming for Mr. K because of his efficient partnership with Hembeck Sisti Hub, also known as HP Sisti Hub. We are an online platform that sells for goods from across the globe. We only pull high quality standard products from anywhere in the world and ship them right to your doorstep. Be it watches, clothes, bags and many others, do get in touch by contacting us on www.henbeckagency.myshopify.com or you can call us on plus 233 546-022-952 or hembecktravels at gmail.com Hembeck Sisti truly a world of endless possibilities Thank you very much um, so if you want to source or buy books bags, I mean clothes and all that from any part of the world to you wherever you are, please contact Handbag 60 Hub on plus 233-546-022-952. Or you can send them an email at handbagtravels at gmail.com or just contact them on Facebook to get your footwears, clothes, watches, bags, and books. They can buy them from China, UK, America, anywhere you want, and they will do the shipping for you at a very affordable price. So please contact them and they will do the best of jobs for you. David, you did your master's in Hungary. What was it about? Well, my master program was a master's in healthcare policy planning and finance and principally health economic socialization. Okay, great. So you come back to that because as part of your introduction, you did mention your health economics. But if anyone wants to pursue postgraduate studies in Hungary, can you tell us what your application process was and how to get that scholarship and all that, if you can take about um, five to seven minutes to take us through that process uninterrupted. Well, thank you. Um, so the Hungarian school system is, is very open. Most of the institutions and schools have the English option, though Hungarian speak Hungarian or Majaro. So, but you can apply, if, I mean, basically we have seen a couple of Ghanaians who are actually pursuing medicine in Hungary, very notable, prominent Ghanaian, um, what do you call it, families and others whose kids are in Hungary pursuing, usually in Debrecen University and some of these medical universities because they are one of the best in the European, uh, Eastern European continent. And also because their fees are low. But if somebody wants to pursue a master program or a PhD or even a bachelor's program in Hungary, you see the stipendium Hungary Corps scholarship I use, then they have to be visiting the stipendium Hungary Com website. Uh, if you type stipendium Hungary Com, um, stipendium Hungary Com is that right? Stipendium. Yeah. Okay. You, you, great. I can type it to you and you can share on the. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So Please go ahead. I'll share the link with them later. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So stipendium Hungary Com. Now they open the office. I open the windows. I think now the dates keep changing, but usually, um, so somewhere towards December, they're about to open, and you can apply online. When you apply, 
they they have left the decision of who gets the scholarship to be the, the uh, jurisdiction of the country scholarship secretary. So you apply to the school, you get you get the school offer, and you go to your the, the scholarship secretariat in the country will call you for interview. So the scholarship secretary will tell you to submit your application forms and others. Then they will schedule an interview and you have the interview. And after the interview, they give opportunity, they select some people who will actually win either the master's, the bachelor's, and also the PhD scholarship. And then they go, they get their stipend, they get accommodated, and they pursue their study. And of course, they are supposed to come back to their country to contribute to the development. So simply, that is the stipend of Hungary scholarship. <laughs> that is very quick, uh, Dave. But I'm just going to interrogate that a little bit more. So basically, like you said, you go to Stipendum Hungaricom. That is the name yeah. of the scholarship site, isn't it? Yes, yes. Brilliant. So for the institutions, if you want to go into any of the schools, um, the application for admission will be separate from the scholarship application. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. So, I mean, I'm asking because in some countries like U.S., in most cases, you have the scholarships coming with the admission. So once you get that, automatically you get that in most cases. But different. that is not the case in the UK. So that's yeah. why I'm asking you. So yours yeah. is separate just like the UK in most cases. Um, yes. And yes. then um, what you are again saying is that the scholarship is usually administered through the, um, how do we call it? The, the, is it a, did you say the, um, can, you, can you remind me again? Yeah, the, the country scholarship secretariat. Your country's scholarship secretariat, isn't yes. it? Yes, so your country decides who gets the scholarship and who does not. Okay, so once you apply through the Hung um, stipendum Hungaricum, it comes to your country's um, scholarship secretariat, and you go there. Once you are shortlisted, you are informed, you go there for an interview. Is that right? Yes, please. Okay, brilliant. So, yeah. I mean how how many years is your master's was your master's because in the uk it's mostly one year how many years was that our program was two years two years okay. yeah two years as part of your application did you see that it covers nursing midwifery any other fields or it is specific programs that are covered by these scholarships actually um the the agreement there's an agreement between the university or the country your country and the stipendium Hungaricom in terms of determining the courses they think are important to the country's development. So okay. there are a basket of courses. Perhaps if, if, if there was nursing masters, perhaps I might have chosen nursing. Mm -hmm. uh, this was probably one or two, there were about three health related courses. And this was one that was public health and others, and I chose this. So um, that it's limited depending on your country. Okay, great. Of course, once you were there, I did pay you a visit in Hungary, but mm -hmm. I'm not qualified to talk about the standard of living in there. Do you want to share with us if someone is considering going to Hungary? What is the standard of living? Is the stipend okay? Is there anything, tips you want to share with people? Well, uh, if if you are going to a stipendium Hungaricum, you'll be given an, a stipend. You'll be accommodated in a dormitory, a hotel, and you share rooms. And... Um, I think basically the stipend they give you if when you get there within the first few months when you don't have anything, it's cool. You are okay, you can eat, you can, but it cannot take you to the games and to be clubbing and what people do and I mean roaming around and a lot of sightseeing. But to to get your bars, go to school and come back and your metro and your car credit and all that, that is cool. On the other hand, uh, the government of Ghana was also giving allowances to us. And okay. that was what changed the game. So then you had a little more to spend and to do other stuff. A couple of people paid their student loans from that. And um, it's cool. Hungary is, um, you, you don't spend much in Hungary. Um, those days in 2017, we're spending as low as, uh, our stipend was around 650 Ghana cities in 2017. Which was, really? I don't know, a dollar, I've forgotten, but... It was like one one fifty one fifty something dollars then per month. That was your wow. packet apart from your your accommodation, which was also the same. But 
Yeah, I mean, definitely you can spend. I mean, Budapest, for instance, if you are living in Budapest, you can spend a lot more. So the cost of living in, in Hungary is low. And that is why people who want to pursue med programs like medicine and others, when they want to look at Eastern European countries, then they actually want to focus on Hungary because it's, it's one of the best tourist destinations in Europe. Number one to number two around the world. So Budapest is an exciting place to be. I enjoy the place. And I think you did too, to the extent that we missed our train. <laughs> uh, that's right so uh, so i mean in terms of um what you've described so far will you recommend the educational system to someone watching us who is yet to make a decision on pursuing postgraduate studies outside africa how is their educational system is it good i mean of course that may be a not be so good to us but i mean you've not had the benefit of studying in any other developed country so it may be difficult to compare but at least you have the benefit of comparing that to the ghanaian educational system do you think it's something you recommend to someone well um i i, I think that um i would really recommend i would really recommend uh, basically because there is a culture in our system okay. and we must say that it limits people, even in the classroom. It limits people. It limits people because, I mean, there, I mean, except a few lecturers who, who give that opportunity. For instance, if you take me to a classroom, you want to me to memorize formulas that I'll be using on SL. These are some of the things. If I go to your statistics class and you tell me to memorize uh, and reproduce formulas to calculate sample size, Mm. about 15 of them meanwhile in my statistics class in budapest you bring your laptop you bring your notes you can refer to anything just that the question there is not in your notes because it tells you that when you are out there in the workplace you would probably talk to a friend you would probably revise your notes you do that thing, so you don't need to put this in your head so okay. these people have the room to innovate to think mm. We spend our time cramming and reproducing. We spend our time in Africa, basically, we are pushed to cram and reproduce and show that what is in the nose. But out there, you have the liberty to produce knowledge, to challenge knowledge, to challenge a lot of things, and to take your own path. And I think that is why they, they are much innovative and developing. And if that culture stops, then I think our education system will be better off. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. So last week, I mean, when I interviewed your own mate, Evans from Ponche, we did talk about the fact that incorporating um, models or subjects like healthcare financing into our curriculum would be good because as healthcare professionals, and I mean, as very basic knowledge that we need to know or we need to have, um, these are missing in our, our curriculum. So you are health economics for that matter what will you share with us as part of your reflections um, with respect to the healthcare financing in Africa and Ghana specifically? Um, do you think um, there's something that can be done? What are your initial observations about healthcare financing in general? Yeah. Well, um, sincerely, um, I must say that Africa is trying. Ghana, for instance, uh, in the sub-Saharan African region, we are one of the strongest healthcare systems in terms of financing, basically as a result of health insurance that we have. But the problem is about sustainability. Mm. Now, um, principally, you know, we move from the era of out-of-pocket payments, what we call cash and carry, to a new social health insurance system, which uh, is partly, is basically funded by taxes. We have the, uh, the NHI, the National Health Insurance Levy, we pay when we transact business and all that. Now, the problem with our health finances system and our health insurance system is a subject of two things, quality and also um, government commitment. Now, when these taxes get to government, because their fiscal space is small, they try to, they don't release all the money that needs to come to the health insurance 
fund. So the health insurance fund may be lacking in payment or reimbursement of the hospitals and the providers that provide these services. And at the end of the day, these hospitals or providers also had borrowed drugs and the services of others that they need to pay for. As a result, um, they are not able to pay these people and then drugs that are supp supposed to be reimbursed, people do not need to pay on the health insurance. They have to pay for it. They have to buy it out of the hospital. And this actually has watered down the health insurance system. Now, basically, in the UK and the NHI, NHS, you know that definitely uh, the NICE, basically, people know that the NICE is not so sustainable, but I mean, in terms of um, there are ways that it could be changed. I mean, because it's like you get access to healthcare for free and at various levels, and people have challenged that. But um, I believe that the NICE is somewhat way more sustainable because it has also got structures. Mm. Beyond Ghana's healthcare system. Now, what supports NICE is that NICE actually has implemented an objective criteria for decision making and reimbursement. That is the introduction of health technology assessment from the onset. So, health technology assessment helps us prioritize which healthcare interventions we can finance as a country, considering the cost and the consequences altogether. Then we can select the interventions which are not the cheapest and also the interventions which are not the most effective, but the ones that give us a blend of the two so that we can cover more and give a lot more healthy life years to our population. So in Ghana's healthcare system, Recently, Ghana have started institutionalizing HTA, and currently I'm I'm writing a thesis on this. That what is do you mean by HTA? That is health technology assessment. Mm. So currently, I'm writing my thesis. Uh, the thesis I'm doing another master of health economy program at the University of Ghana. I'm writing a thesis on health technology assessment, and I'm trying to assess the stakeholders and their perspectives about how they want Ghana's HTA system to be, because okay. it's the foundation. If you don't, if you miss it, then tomorrow any government will come. Let us use aeroplanes to distribute medicines. Mm. Or let us uh, use caterpillars, caterpillars to, I mean, everybody will bring interventions that they think is on their heart. But the question is, are these, inter are these interventions that we can afford as a nation? Is it on our priority list? Mm. And that is what HTA seeks to do. So Ghana's Healthcare finances benefit so much from You see, that's that's brilliant. But interestingly, I mean, as of twenty eighteen, we had about sixty percent of the entire Ghanaian population still not covered by national health insurance. Still out of pocket payment is still very paramount. Do you think they are? Of course, you are talking about HTA, which is one of the I mean solutions for that. Do you think there are other innovative ways we can help to enroll everyone on this national health insurance? Because people are dying, and sometimes recently there's been complaints about the fact that even the ambulances that are actually dispatched to each district or constituency for people to use them, once you call them, you need to pay some money before it is fueled and you are taken to hospital. That obviously is disheartening. Do you think there are other better ways beyond the HTA to ensure that we get a lot of people onto this insurance and to finance our healthcare system better in a better way. You spoke about NICE, NHS. We pay all those monies indirectly through taxes. And so yeah. at least you know that once you go in there, your health to an, a larger extent is, 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 is in, a, in a good hands. Great. Any, any ideas, Dave? Yeah, so I think as I explained earlier, the major problem is that the taxes that the government take hmm. to to give to the health insurance they don't allocate it either fully or they allo they delay in allocation they borrow some of the tax for nhis to open up the space space to do a lot of other things okay mm -hmm. so definitely economic growth as a national economic economic growth is very important and it has it has a way that it affects the way we can reimburse Mm. certain conditions and medications and others. But the major thing is that the governments and every government of the day, 
must be committed to allocating the funds for health. Now, it is recommended that to achieve universal health coverage, government should commit at least five to six percent of their GDP uh, to, 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 to healthcare. It's not happening. It's not happening. Yeah. It's not happening, obviously. The Abuja commitment was even looking at 15%. And even the five, we are not getting. So it's about government commitment. If we want this to stand, we want our healthcare system to be great, government must be committed to allocate those funds and support uh, support healthcare with the, the money that is needed so that we can try. Thank you, David. Thank you. But beyond, I mean, that, of course, those ones lies in the hands of policymakers. We can only deliberate on that for now and, of course, mm -hmm. push that through advocacy. For healthcare professionals, what do you think um, will be the importance of perhaps introducing something like healthcare finance and health policy planning and all that in a curriculum? Just in a minute, what will be it benefit? Well, because I, I, I hold the view that as a nurse, as a doctor, as a midwife, whatever the field may be, you need to have some basic knowledge about, I mean, healthcare financing, isn't it? Yeah, it's about time, Precious. It's about time. Because, you see, if you don't understand the system you're working in and how it operates, you'll be frustrated in the system. You have to understand what is going on at the top. What decisions the administrators, what decisions the health directors, what decisions the policy makers are making and how we trickle down to the work that you do. And that is why it's very, very important. And if you understand healthcare financing, if you understand healthcare policy planning, then your perspective will change some of the things you complain about, you wouldn't, but it also change the way you work. Mm. To change the way you work, because you understand how resource is scarce and you would have to be a custodian, a good custodian of those resources how you have to make your, your input and, and your, 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 your work hours count. And you know, I mean, you were working in Ghana as a nurse before. And you know the amount of commitment you guys put in in the UK com compared to what we put in in the country. So I think it's very important, especially we could start with managers and world leaders and we could trickle down to, to the general curriculum. Okay, interesting. Finally, let's talk about Syrian Research Institute. You are the country director, Charlie. You are a big man. You are a big oh. man. You are the country director for Syrian Research Institute. Tell us a bit about Syrian. Um, how did you um, become associated with them? What do you do in this position? And what is the objective or the aim of this particular institution in Ghana? Take about three minutes to talk about that if you don't Okay, mind. so Syrian Research Institute uh, is founded by Zoltan Kalo, Paul Kion, and Zoltan Voko. And two of them were my lecturers at my health economics program. Actually, they started the MSc Healthcare Policy Planning Financing in the university I attended. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of experience in training and they have a private research institute. So as a student, uh, by God's grace, uh, we gave our best when we were in school and we acquired discovered. So we started internships there and the relationship continued. So we came to Ghana and um, we continued the relationship. We've been working remotely. And I mean, it's not like I just came and everything came and you are now this, no. It took a long period from, from about March, 2020. And earlier on I've written emails, I want to be part and others. And they are not here from March 2020, they've got us at the we started training and it took us almost a year to train. And afterwards, we be handling health, economic, and systematic literature review projects as a team locally. And just in March, exactly March 12th, five years exactly after I left Papon nursing training, my 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 superiors came down to Ghana. I received them at Kotika International Airport. So March 12th was a very important day for me because five years ago I was leaving my job. And the next five years, I'm receiving partners. So they came into Ghana, and actually, we are planning to expand, do market development for the African and Sub Saharan African region. And fortunately, I'm leading the Nigeria aspect. A colleague, George Dennis Oben, who also trained in Budapest, also leading the scientific directorship. So, what we are doing is that we want to train and build a team of health economics in Ghana who can run on international projects. And again, we can also um, run local projects that will be relevant to impacting our countries. 
So March 21st, we together with the Ishpo Ghana chapter organized the first maiden scientific conference symposium on healthcare priority setting uh, together with Ghana Ishpo chapter. And it was a great meeting with a lot of people from the ministry, universities, and academia and all that was great. So that is what we are doing to now. That, that, that's interesting. So if there are people watching who would like to also be associated and perhaps learn more about health economics, health policy planning, or perhaps get some sort of, I mean, certification or association, how do they get in touch with you and your team? Oh, well, so for um, for Sirion, uh, I mean, can send me an email at david.ameao at sirion.eu. Okay. Send an email, david.amel at syrian.eu. I must say that we are not actively recruiting. We we are developing the team. People who have inquiries, I will be glad to support, to direct them. I have a couple of people that I'm actually trying to help to find their way that are interested in what we are doing. It's open for economists, people who don't have any health background, but economists, open for people in business, people also in the healthcare field. Okay. No, that's fantastic. I think it ties in with what we we ought to be discussed before this. So you are literally setting the pace to help raise a team of health economics and all that. I think that is brilliant. Thank you very much, Dave um, Amiel, for being here with us. Um, is there anything you want to share with us, Dave? Um, anything you've said so far that you would like to um, talk about? But even before that, I, I I feel the work you've been doing with the holistic team is very fantastic, isn't it? And like you did mention, people have been supporting and all that. God bless all those people. If there's someone who is touched by our, by our conversation and want to reach out to support you and your team, how did they reach you, Dave? Well, so um, the first way they can give is um, they can go to givingway, givingway.org. And uh, I think I will share a link with you and put in the, in the comment section, givingway.org and search for holistic nutrition. We have a lot of fundraisers up that they can contribute to via Stripe or credit card or anything. If they also want to give uh, mobile money, our mobile money number is 0557 I'm sure. I'm sure you want to mean plus two three three first because uh, yeah, there's no reason to that. Yes. Yeah. 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 But uh, I mean, anybody can reach us on holisticnutrition at gmail dot com. Can you mention the number again? Plus two three three. Yeah. Yeah. Five five seven. Yeah. Nine six zero. Nine six zero. One nine one. One nine one. Yeah. So yeah. I've put that, that in the app. Our merchant line. Some people usually have a challenge with wave. People that use okay. wave, but um, if you contact, if you have any challenge with using, because it is in the name of policy nutrition and my name all combined. But okay. we, we will also put our bank, uh, our bank. Um, what do you call it? But the easiest way is to give by the giving way. You can give by any of those uh, ways. And okay. also, so policy nutrition at gmail.com is our contact. And you can contact us also. Thank you very much, Dave. I mean, viewers, Dave and his team have been doing very fantastically well. I have known David for a while. I mean, the journey up to this level is 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 just mind blowing. Like I said, we were all teaching in nursing and military training college. David just woke up one day, decided he's quit a job. He's just going to focus on holistic nutrition, and he wasn't, I mean, certain of any income at that point. He had been sustaining this particular organization up till now until he traveled for his master's. He's back, he's still holding the fort. And like he said, at the moment that he's working, he contributes 10%, at least 10% of his own income to support these people and then the donations of other people. Of course, this can only be a gold, a golden heart, someone with a heart of gold. So I really want to encourage you, if you want to support David and his team, um, the number is plus 233-557. 960191. I've put that in the chat. You can also reach out to them on their Facebook. I mean, through Facebook Messenger, Holistic Nutrition. They are doing fantastically well. When you go there, you see a lot of the things they are doing. And I've shown you some of the pictures. So, I mean, it's been a privilege, David. Um, 
at long last we've been able to sit and chat of course i can chat with you over and over and over again yeah, yeah. but um let me find out are there any final words for us in a minute or two anything that you want to highlight or perhaps you want to talk about that i, I didn't ask you i mean from my well my um, what one thing i want to highlight is this that um it is very important to to have a purpose in life and uh, one of the things you must understand we won't be here forever Mm. And everyone has an opportunity to give. Everyone. You may mm. not be able to give to holistic, but make sure that you touch the life that is closest to you. Mm. That's, I mean, the school child, the child who is like five, six years in your community, mother is not able to buy school uniforms, the child is not in school. We just buy the uniform. That could end a lot of pain for a child and could mm. determine, be the game changer between the child becoming prosperous in life or not. So let us love. It is very important. Let's all not love in words, but it is. It makes it pragmatic because that is why we are here on this earth. Apart from that, everything you have played, you live it one day. That is what I want to say. Fantastic. I'm happy I was able to do this with you. Holy Star. That is his name. Holy Star. Thank you very much, Dave. And I remember your campaign slogan, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. Charlie, yeah. you've come a long way. God bless you for coming today. Just to read some comments to you. Agbenu Jio says, I'm enjoying the show. She said you should talk about holistic nutrition. I'm sure you've spoken about that. Asante Berima Yao Firifa says, keep up the good work, bro. Mary Bimpoma says, great work, bro. Keep doing it. Samuel Achim says, wonderful. Irene Bosman says, the only CEO of Holistic Nutrition you do all. And Irene again says, CEO and country director. Well done. Um, Prince J. Balfour says, great work, massive impact, impact um, inspiring story, great personality. Mr. David Aviao, I salute you. And as Obin says, great impact, wonderful personality, and a great mind. And NS again says, his knowledge on health economics is great hosted him and my antimicrobial resistance program and his presentation was amazing oh yeah and i remember someone in chroma says keep it up Dave. so viewers it's been a pleasure doing this with you we could continue with this over and over and over and over again of course but Dave, it's been a pleasure personally you've impacted me like i said when i came to KNUST, mm -hmm. you were one of the very few people i met and we, we moved on from just being a class rep orienting another class rep to handing mm -hmm. over as a president to a president. We become brothers, we become prayer partners at points. We've, we've shared a lot of things. Um, yeah. There are many things I can say, but I think what I would say is that you're very passionate about this holistic thing and many others. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that. God sees your heart and the many people who are around also sees the good you are doing. And I pray that God will meet you at the point of your need. May you not lack in whatever you do. Keep pushing, and I'm sure God himself will visit you very soon in a very fantastic way. So, so thank you very much. Thank Holy you, Star. I'm very it's been a pleasure. Fantastic. Do have a lovely evening. And viewers, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure doing yeah. this. Catch you again sometime, and have a wonderful evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you join us from. Stay blessed. We out. Life is a journey, and sometimes can be a lonely road. When friends and loved ones forsake you, all you got to do is to be bold. I knew it years ago that those who undermined me had their minds undermined, but I never mind they should keep on undermining because I'm a real good, I must undergo mining. Talking of mining, it leads to discovery. We mine to discover, we learn to discover, we observe to discover. Friends can uncover you at the same time discover you. But I don't want to discover you, I would rather discover more so I go on the internet and I listen to words of wisdom and intellect, availability of information, interviews of great men and women all over the diaspora and all the issues, creativity at its best, dexterity of research, no need to go through any formal education, I introduce you to the discovery show, let your friends and your family know the struggles before the blow. Their highs and their lows. Pay attention to this show. It will make you feel at ease. The Discovery Show on YouTube got the steez. Now, Perry, the presenter, please pose for the camera. I want to hear you say cheese. We are airborne like a flu. I want to hear you sneeze. It's true. The Discovery Show is live on earth.
Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. See ya. TDS TV, Young to Learn. Host, Harry Precious. Executive Producer, James.